four days ago, a progressive political commentator by the name of Michael Brooks suddenly died. Blood clot in his throat. He was 37 years old, he was extremely young, and had what looked like an, ex had a, an unbelievably influential political career ahead of him. He was the host of the Michael Brooks Show, or TMBS. He was a co-host of the Majority Report with Sam Cedar, uh, or rather a contributor to it and a weekly host of it. And this is somebody who didn't by a, lo by, by a long shot have the biggest platform in progressive political commentary but was known and respected by just about every progressive in the political commentary sphere. Um, probably had the widest, broadest network of friends within progressive circles, and it was partly because of, probably largely because of the, It was largely because of the, the philosophy and um, moral ideology that drove his that drove his brand hey, and Mike. drove his yeah. speech. And hey, his we need to talk. Quick, meet me at those oil derricks just outside town, El Burro Heights, and make sure you're not tailed. Man, that don't sound too good, homie. Look, I'm on my way. So, understanding Michael Brooks's philosophy and understanding his work requires understanding a huge ton of things. When I was first joining um, left political circles, I had a lot of difficulty with a couple of things. One of which was that it seemed like there wasn't much... It seemed like there was a huge disconnect in the left where we, there were so many different ideologies contributing to the left that we didn't really have a unified uh, central political ideology. It seemed like a, it seemed like this broad coalition of communists and Marxists and social democrats and uh, left-leaning neoliberals. There's a, um, there's a congressional candidate who, um, I'm not gonna name largely because I don't I don't want to boost his platform because he's still running. And when he was interviewed uh, on his positions um, with the slightest ounce of criticism, he kind of just phased out completely. And when he was asked about his positions, Somebody help me. yeah, what's up? So yeah, this candidate, when asked about When asked about the positions that, that he holds and, and what his ideology is, what he stands for, what he's running for, he basically was like, yeah, like Medicare for all, Green New Deal, that kind of stuff, 15 an hour. I'm not, that's not me putting a droning voice to it. That was the voice in which he said it. Um, he had absolutely no enthusiasm, apparently, for the campaign. He was just like, yeah, you know, just like, the regular stuff, like... Ooh, too close. And it was really, really clear that he did not... Damn, it's clear that he didn't know what he was running for. Um, with him, it was a bigger thing, that he was clearly grifting. But the problem was that people fall for it because people don't really understand what they're right. really standing for. So left candidacies and left politics have basically become one giant walking litmus test so, of... Well. These this are the policies fun. you should hey, support, and you if again, you support man. them, you're one of us. Is it really? Yeah, it um, really is. And that's really problematic I because <laughs> I was gonna say you dead, can be a Nazi funny, and support what do you think? That, I mean, that's exactly what, like, that's exactly hey, what someone like a Nazbol is. Is someone who's economically left, but is also an ethnostater. And the big problem is that, like, it's it's very much possible to adopt economic left policies. While not being of the left, while not being a progressive, because you're not really standing for a justice doctrine. 
So when you set the litmus test at whatever economic policies we're looking for in the United States, you're ignoring the big picture. And that's what I felt was the problem with the left, was that, like... Alrighty a, a, then! It's his carbine. Um, Come on, I'm just get gonna in! And that, that was always what seemed like the big problem with the left was... Um, it never operated on a larger... On a larger moral frame. Jesus, that's a bad shot. Nice lie. Mm. So. So what wound up happening Look was. That. You have. You have a bunch of people who support certain policies and they can justify those policies to some extent. But when it comes down to really, really getting to what it is you're looking for in a government, in a state, in a society, it was difficult. It was difficult to get a specific goal it. in mind because the truth is, like, it's a really wide tent. There's communists and Marxists and socialists and social democrats and left neoliberals and all of that kind of stuff. Where from that do you draw an ideology, right? That That's not as simplistic as a, a unified ideology, right? And the truth is, it didn't seem like there was one. So it didn't... I wasn't sure, like, what policy it was. I was... Jesus. You better not be cheating. What Michael Brooks did was he brought... He brought a unified purpose to the left by explaining you know, what it was we were partner. truly fighting for. And once he explained it, you were free to take it or leave it. But the truth is, I, I think that most of us kind of understood what what our unified common goal is. Ah, shit. There's a principle in... There's a principle in spiritual moral teachings and in the speeches of Martin Luther King and after him Cornell West that the unifying principle of left politics is love and not in like a movie way but rather in the the way that uh the way that King describes it, and the way that a lot of leftists describe it is as in the Greek word agape. Uh, Greek has, Not I think, three bad. different words for love. One for romantic and sexual love, one for friendship love, roughly speaking. And then one for what is kind of bastardized as unconditional love, but really it's, a, um, it's an affirming respect for humanity, in a sense. I humanity, sentience, life. It's uh, compassion. Um, the principle that you should have that's compassion not. for something simply because it, it exists. Usually that's, that, that, well, that always goes to humans. It often goes to animals. Um, sometimes it goes to art and culture, typically as extensions of, of people. I think Dr. West particularly extends this to, peop to, to, to culture, um, largely so that he can That's create empathetic it. links between people within those cultures, which is brilliant. You made a noise, shit. Powder in the hole. So that ideology of love is um, very important to what Brooks brings to the left. And there's a spirituality to it that I don't feel is necessary to grasping the ideology. And I think that there are philosophical understandings of empathy that help in this regard. Not bad. Um, that kind of help you to bypass the spiritual aspect of it. I mean, it's still spiritual, right? Spirituality is generally a connection with the emotional self. Nice shot. 
and I, I don't think that I don't think that meta ethics operates very successfully without some level of connection to your emotions such that they exist or such as they exist so this principle of kind of a politicized moralized love nice lie Cornell West takes that, and it, it's it. It's similar to the principle of empathy that builds. Um, so there's this concept called meta ethics. Meta ethics goes beyond morality. Uh, it goes beyond simply talking about how to construct and justify a moral system. And it goes toward justifying and understanding what lies at the very base of that moral system. For example, That's the way I played it. And, and it and it usually manifests in. It usually manifests in. Uh, you laugh. It's difficult to talk about this because I can only talk about it in the terms that Doctor West makes it accessible. Because I too am not like I I'm not like an ethicist or or a philosopher or anything. So philosophy divides itself into two different studies, uh, uh, largely epistemology and ethics. Um, epistemology is, is is epistemology is the study of what is, or more specifically, what is true. And truth is something that is very difficult to define, and that's the point of epistemology is to have a, a kind of a discourse for curating that discussion of, of trying to figure out what exactly does truth mean. And, and and how should we define it and how should we adjudicate it? Not bad. Ethics is the meta ethics specifically is the study of what is good. Um and what is good versus what is bad and the and the concept of value in life. What? And it, and the the study of what is good drives the study of what ought to be. And it's a very difficult and loaded and complicated discussion that, you know, far more capable people than myself have been disagreeing on for years. Generally speaking, most ethicists say that we draw our morals from generally an appreciation for life and a commonality Shit. and emotional and visceral commonality between us and what are called sentient beings so creatures and lives that experience um sensations especially pain and pleasure on the same frequency as humans tend to be the the, the species that we form those empathetic links with jesus christ <laughs> you made a noise, shit. Oh, you pathetic turd. So meta ethics and deriving your concepts of what is good in order to create your uh, perception of what ought to be is a really difficult and long process that involves a lot of understanding phil philosophy, of understanding epistemology, of um, you know, it's like axioms and terminology and all sorts of really, really What I can only imagine is, you know, a frustrating process. In fact, I'm like, I've given up like six times in that process because of how difficult it is. So, That's the way I played it. what what King touched upon and touches upon, which is what spiritual philosophy touches upon, is that it, it brid kind of bridges the gap between. It bridges the gap between empathy and morality using this concept of 
using this concept of moralized love. All right, which way does this lean? This leans to the left, much like myself. Not that far to the left. I hate this fucking game. Yeah, me too. What spiritual philosophy does really well is it makes meta ethics more more accessible to it makes meta ethics more more accessible to people because it moralizes love in a way that is more difficult to do certainly not impossible but more difficult to do if you don't believe in if you don't have spiritual faith So one really cool thing about listening to someone like Cornell West talk to Joe Rogan is that he Not creates bad. what I call empathetic links between cultures by talking about the commonalities that they have. Culture, uh, like art, music, dance, song, uh, love, even sex, like... These are things that cultures have in common and they can find common ground. And when you when you take things like his conversation with Rogan was really, really, really cool. When you take something like jazz, when you take like Duke Ellington and when you take Duke Ellington and Ludwig van Beethoven and you bring them together in a, in, in a linkage conversation. And you're talking about, like, anything, right? I could talk about the harmonic similarities between It Don't Mean a Thing and the Eroica Symphony. i just pulling that out of my wh where whatever. Um, but I'm sure there are, right? I'm way over-adjusting. <laughs> Um, and what I'm doing there is I'm creating cultural bridges Get because it. It. Beethoven's music is influenced by Beethoven's culture. Ellington's music is influenced by Ellington's culture. And the, and while the minutia of their experiences are very different, there are grand sweeping commonalities between them as humans that is reflected in the commonalities in their music. That's something that Cornell West does uniquely well. And it creates an access to empathy and an access to that moral love. That's the way I played that it. People aren't necessarily that good. People aren't necessarily capable of accessing themselves without the right push. There's a is a kind of a trope that the more exposed you are to a different Canadian, culture, the more exposed you are champion. to people of a different culture, the more he, the more you humanize them and the more you empathize with them. And it's just like, that's true, but we also overstate the organic nature of that process. Just because you're exposed to a different culture doesn't... so. That's a bunker. Just because you, there you go. just because you have a black friend, does not mean you're not going to hold anti-black views. They will probably be tempered and even somewhat dispelled. And if you have overt racism, it might be fixed by exposure. But there's plenty of different, you know, cognitive biases and fallacious like ideas that you can use to justify political positions you have that. Um, said friend may even call abhorrent. Let's do the power edge. What is this wind? Oh, it's just a power wedge. So it's really bad. inaccurate. So... What West does is he takes that starting point of, yes, you, you can dispel, you can dispel racism with exposure, exposure to the group that you're racist against, and he adds intent to it 
by guiding the person who has been exposed to the culture in the direction that leads to uh, the dispelling of their bigotry. And that's a really important step in the process. Uh, w without that, you just kind of have a token black friend, and that's not going to help as much. So Michael Brooks was very heavily influenced by Cornell West. I mean, that much is clear. Uh, he routinely referred to West as the, the most important public intellectual um, of our time. And I, you know, it's hard to disagree with him. Um, West is nice. incredibly knowledgeable <laughs> and has such a... a fascinating command over over discourse and that sounds really hackneyed but like have fun in there this is a person who knows how to talk to people in a way that like I don't think many like I think there are probably a hundred people on the planet who can talk to people the way that Cornell West does Forming bonds and relationships and That's respect and pinpointing and playing up the empathy of the person he interacts with and finding that empathetic link, that empathetic link, is a really, really, really fascinating skill. And it's something that West uses really well. What? My face is completely hidden by my microphone. One sec. All right. You laughed. So that was one of Brooks's primary influences. And Brooks brought that principle of love. The problem with Cornell West was that he was, that he is, uh, he was at the time, nice. until probably a year ago. All right, so I've, I've done golf with a friend. My God, you are lucky, Mr. Townley. Let's drop off. You gonna drop me off, Mr. Phillips? You wanna hang out some more? Yeah. So the problem with Cornell West was that he is a scholar, he's an academic, and largely speaking, the accessibility of Cornell West's work and. Uh, contributions to discourse were very much oh, limited to academia simply because of the environment in which he existed. We could go to the movies. We're close to a theater. I would imagine if I had taken courses on race and race relations and on race studies at, um, at NYU, I probably would have heard a lot more about Dr. West. But instead, I got exposed to a more a more popular, a more a more neoliberal form of race liberation. Okay, and I here we use are, that T. carefully because later. I have a lot of respect Just for people like, like Tana Coates Mikey. and other um, <clears throat> more mainstream, like Van Jones, who have real uh, voices and power who have used said voices to make a lot more people care about a serious, serious race problem that America has. But there's a much deeper critique of social justice in the United States that goes all the way back to Martin Luther King's criticisms of capitalism that have gotten lost in the ages. Um, lost is a bit uh, harsh a term, but those critiques are carried on heavily by race scholars in academia, um, and Dr. West is one of the, probably one of the most eloquent of those scholars. It's very difficult to find eloquent people in academia generally. Um, Cornell West is one of them. So it was very difficult to get a message like that outside of academia, and Brooks, one of Brooks's primary passions was bringing that message out. 
And it was such an important message because when you've got a movement full of like, you know, every different kind of anti-capitalist and then also like a bunch of different kinds of capitalists, including like social democrats and left neoliberals. Like... Oh, that's a stunt jump. I'm going to try it again. What wound up working was like Michael Brooks came out and he was basically like he amplified the message that Cornell West had. I think bringing Cornell West's message to a larger audience was really important. And since then, Cornell West himself has been ex uh, far more active in widening his own audience, his own horizons, which is so, so important. The fact that he has a podcast now is just wonderful. Um, this is a man who needs to be heard it by as many people as humanly possible. Alright, cool. So, yeah, this is a man who needs to be heard by as many people as possible. And I think his involvement with local GSA chapters, um, Brooks' enablement of them. Brooks was a huge part of mainstreaming that discourse. Um, the political love discourse. And I think that's the name he himself put to it. Political love. Not sure if West, if West coined that, if Brooks coined that, or if even there was a speech by Dr. King where he used it. But I, I think either West or Brooks coined that term specifically. Uh, political love, and it's basically a. It's basically the synthesizing of empathy-based metaethics with. the surface level activism that we engage with on a political level. And it allows, um, Jamie Peck said this on the majority report, it allows like an anarcho-communist or a you know, global stateless communist to form a political alliance with a social democrat when you have absolutely no common political end goals, virtually hey, no David. common political end goals, except for maybe single payer oh, healthcare. That's right? nice, you didn't tell me we were double dating. So because of the lack of direction I perceive the left to have, Mike. This ain't the best time, I'm kinda busy. Hi to me! To Brad! Those times so one of the difficulties getting involved with the left was because of what I was talking about before, where the left didn't seem to have an underlying understanding of an ideology. Like a moral ideology. You know, you had me it seemed back. like they were pretty I'm happy. On the west side of the tower. Get us in position. They were pretty I'll happy drop. um throwing their lot in with figures that were extremely problematic to me. Um, today it's happening specifically with like people like Tucker Carlson and right-wing populists of you the like. Back in the day it was uh, Tulsi Gabbard because no, Tulsi Gabbard signaled as an anti-imperialist but the truth is she was not she was not actually for ending U.S. military Hold on one sec Sidelines. I don't know what you're talking about I didn't stop Cinema equipment, not surveillance <laughs> Grab his other arm No, 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 no oh, 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 oh. Ah! You think you're impenetrable? <laughs> See how you feel with this is 18 inches deep inside. Get the lube. <laughs> Who the fuck is this? Terminate him. Close this problem right now. Yeah, I can use a little backup here. Get me the station, chick! 36 flow. I got you. Don't harm the asset. There's another shoot! Help me! What? Stop. Stop hitting the Windows button. This is unacceptable. No! Shooters across the street. Don't, don't drop it. Don't, don't drop it. Hey, why are we just hanging here? Hey, Dooley. I'm not leaving here until you shoot those guys. So get moving on it. Get 
So I care, obviously, about American progressive politics. You got a bogey coming at you, Franklin! Shit! But it's not the only country that I care. Um, I do care a lot about fighting fascism in South Asia as well. And the main source of fascism in South Asia comes from, well, my own religion. So the thing about Tulsi Gabbard, Who are you obviously, you know, she used to be against LGBTQ rights and stuff and did a turnaround on that. I'm not necessarily going to hold that alone against her. But her entire career, her political career, was kickstarted by the American chapter of the Hindu Parishat, which is the military wing of the RSS in India. So this is the terrorist. This is the terrorist wing of India's fascist party. Don't worry, they'll look after you. The things those people did to me. I'm an American citizen. Yeah, well that don't seem to matter too much. And the reason they did that was that she is a lifetime Modi supporter. Um. where she defended Modi after the U.S. tried to deny him diplomatic status for his handling of the anti-Muslim pogrom in Gujarat in 2002. So she's been a long-time ally to Hindu fascism. And she comes out in 2020 signaling, you know, we have to end, stop the endless wars, which, you know, good message in a vacuum. But she doesn't actually... She doesn't actually take much in the way of real anti-imperialist positions. She's still, and her and her anti-interventionism is rooted not in a not in a value for um, the lives that we're ruining, but rather for the lives that we're risking going in. To the point where she's like super protectionist about like. She's anti-refugee immigration from the Middle East, right? She's anti... Um, she waffles in her rhetoric on um, on India going into Kashmir, right? So... The thing about Tulsi is that, like, she is not of the global left. And it's clear in the people who have boosted her campaign, the rhetoric she has shown in her foreign policy speech, and just the forces that surround her rise to political power. Who's B? So, what really frustrated me was the myopia of, of an American left movement that was willing to ally itself with such an anti-left political candidate and was unable to see how venomous she was to global progressivism and global social justice. And Michael Brooks was one of the few people who was very vocally coming out and saying, like, if you're a progressive, Tulsi Gabbard's not your friend. Um, and what happened there was for the first time, I saw a white American progressive caring about the politics, really caring about not just American intervention, but the internal politics. He would start talking about the Hindu right. And I saw an American progressive caring about the politics of a country that he didn't have personal stakes in, which is not something I'd ever done, right? Like, I care about, you know, Belgian politics because I grew up in Belgium, uh, or EU politics because I grew up in the EU. I care about... American politics because I'm American. I care about, you know, South Asian politics because I, um, I'm of South Asian origin. But when it comes to um, when it comes to other countries, I never really, like, paid attention to the politics of other countries. So to see Brooks doing that 
was extremely positive and also kind of a glass breaker for me because it's not something I had ever done myself. So yeah, uh, right after that was the point that Brooks then started making content about Lula and Brazil and all of the um, all of the pivotal things going on in South America, uh, especially. And at, at that point, suddenly I had realized kind of what Brooks's brand was, and it was clearly this globalized devotion to uh, protecting a progressive experiment, which I, I had never seen before, right? Usually we were, we were big on anti-imperialism, obviously, but a genuine commitment to protecting left experiments abroad um, and, and building global solidarity I was... Left, you say right. I say become a doctor. You say become a patient. I say, who was, is that? Was different Hello? for me. This idea Where's of global progressivism was particularly yeah, appealing to me uh, we because should, we should, uh, some other what had gone down, the, the flaws the I had seen in the American hey, lab. Yourself, man. Lamar, what's what and you stress set up? We the parallels rate, between move us up the food chain, nigga, for UKIP, Not this really in this the Tory town, party, particularly where you stress concern. Democrats, and Bernie, Trump, you got to and you know, the Bolsonaros and the Modi's of the world, world and, um, hey, how important it was to fight banging. global fascism. Either you got some As I saw more of Brooks's coverage of global shit, politics, what the fuck are you doing? Um, it occurred to me that really what his brand was and what, what he was about and just kind of synthesizes with his this idea of the politics of love is, is that like the reason that it creates the space for so many people to participate in a left movement despite having wildly different ideologies is that there is a commonality of outcome that you're looking for, which is ultimately total social and economic justice. Without pretense as to what that constitutes, right? So, like, even an anarcho-communist who, like, believes in, um stateless, you know, stateless Marxist society is ultimately doing so because such a society is a means to an end. So once you agree upon the end, and you agree that there is a baseline common means, it becomes a lot less important to bicker over the minutia of what you do once you get to a social democracy. Everyone agrees that we need to get to a social democracy, so that's what we fight for to start with. And that was the real function of the, of, of the moral, of kind of like the moral ideology of like, understanding this as a, as a movement of like, almost of, of like, Humanism is, is kind of the wrong word, but it's because it's also a very spiritual movement, but uh, of, a, of, a, of a dedication to humanity, right? As opposed to getting bogged down in the details of what your economic theory was. And that's what allowed for coalition building in, in a huge sense. Because granting that we agree on what the out what what the end outcome should be, it becomes very easy to, to, to be amenable to whatever achieves that outcome. Instead of arguing over, you know, what economic system we want to get there. First let's get to a so social democracy, see if it works, and then continue working from there. And that was a real that was the really effective facet of, of Brooks's rhetoric was that it, it unified the moral goals 
of a left movement in a way that the varied uh, ideologies never could. And that, in turn, created room for me in, in the left, right? Of course, I mean, I would have had room in the left just, you know, by virtue of the majority report existing. But, because I think Sam Cedar and I, I think Sam Cedar is probably the public, public person that I align most closely with, uh, politically. Um, there aren't very many positions on which I think he and I disagree. And, in fact, I don't know if there are any positions on which I flat out disagree with him. Um, there are positions of that question, but, like, very few of them. And he's very well spoken and very well justified in his beliefs, and there we go. So, yeah, I, I definitely really like the Majority Report, but the global lens particularly is not something that Sam Seaver has. It, it, it's something that he doesn't really focus on because he prefers to focus on domestic policy. So, I'm, what's really important to me as a kind of third culture American who has, you know, grown up in, in, in a separate culture, who is, you know, is a, is a first generation American from another culture that is also plagued by kind of this, this fascistic history and ongoing uh, struggle against fascism. Um, that global lens was really important to me. And uh, someone like Michael Brooks being able to synthesize uh, alongside Dr. West, like being able to, Jesus Christ, being able to synthesize that, that global lens with the new left the new budding leftism within me um, was really, really significant. And so many people have these stories, right, of like how pivotal Michael Brooks was to their evolution politically, and I have very little trouble believing it, because, you know, I have a similar experience. So yeah, I mean, this was a really important person, and I don't know how the movement replaces him. It, it is a massive loss. So yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, Michael Brooks was the person who basically helped me synthesize a yeah, lot of different things. The more I see your boss, the more um, I like him. I was you, I wouldn't be so critical of who others from, associate with. So is he gonna be a finding problem? underlying moral sure. ideologies to all but of these political positions I hold. If something happened to him right um, now, I'd be right using under that a to microscope. Create unity An electron a microscope of bureaucratic of. shit, and that would make it very difficult to keep old secrets. Holding the left oh, accountable well. in, the, in a way that I felt was really missing in the you time that I was trying to find trouble keeping it. secrets, asshole. Um, Me. After you brought Trevor in on this, I only brought him in after you put out your press release. And really giving a shit about again. global justice. Really, 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 really. Like this, this massive solidarity ideology. Heat on Earth the so... Yeah, like I was saying, I, I really just... I want to become a wonk on something. I just want to... I want to study one particular issue and just become an expert on it. Um, and I, I think there's a couple of like decent places where I could start. Healthcare is one. Um, I think healthcare is a lot of complexity to it that um, I have a decent, I have a decent foothold in it. Um, I'm from a country with an extremely successful multiplayer healthcare system. Um, you know, fighting for Medicare for all. I, I live in an Obamacare country, in a, in a kind of government marketplace country, and I could very much, I think, become an expert on healthcare. And it's 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 very difficult for most people to do. I think it would be less difficult for me. Um, and I have a head start on it. Hey, I'm going, Not man, before you take advantage. But um, that's one place I could go. And then the other kind of obvious option is um, Indian politics. Um, something we should all care about. It's the 
the fastest growing, like, not fastest growing, but like, it's the world's biggest democracy, and um, right now it's headed in a really bad direction, especially right now. Um, what I, one thing I really want to understand well is, uh, I really want to, I want, I want to read about the history of Kerala and understand how that kind of pocket of successful left experimentation has worked within a larger liberalizing, globalizing, kind of neoliberal um, cluster F that is the late 20th century manifestation of India. And that would be a really interesting thing to learn about the South Asian subcontinent. Um, I can go back and, you know, also read my old texts about caste, this time not reading it for a grade. Um, so there's a lot of foundation I have for learning about India. So those are things I'm looking at, like, I'm trying to figure out what particularly I want to, um, I want to get hev most heavily into. Hey, you got all luck, mom. So yeah, it'll be interesting to find stuff there. Um, I'm sure I could take both of those on. Right now I'm listening to, um, right now I'm listening to Cornell West's uh, assortment of Dr. King speeches. And I think next is going to be Orwell's homage to Catalonia. Because I think I want to get a, a, just get a feel, a little bit more of a feel for like a, Catalonia is a really interesting topic, I think, and uh, that'll be interesting to read about, especially from, like, the eyes of Orwell, and, um, yeah, so right now I'm looking at more kind of general readings, um, but at some point I'm going to get more granular, um, Specifically on healthcare and on on healthcare and hopefully on India as well. India is a big, um, a, just a massive topic. But I've got some decent places to start. Uh, I think once I get back to New York, I can probably try and hit up my storage unit and get my copies of um, just a few few like assigned readings I used to have back in the day in school and reread those. Um, uh, I still have access to the assigned to the to the web readings actually from my classes like four years ago, so I can start reading those as well. Um, in fact, I'm looking for, for stuff to read while I'm like in my room because I don't get Wi-Fi in my room or service, so it's it's or any kind of internet. So it might even be valuable to do that. But yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's 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 really interesting and inspiring and saddening to see the kind of effect to see the kind of effect that someone like Michael Brooks had on my life and my politics. And you know, all I can say is that like for all of the disagreements that he had with all of the people he formed relationships with, just by virtue of, you know, being part of a very diverse coalition of people. I think the world is gonna be a lot better off for him having been in it, and we are a lot worse off for having lost him. Uh, and our work gets a lot harder because we have to continue and rebuild the work he was doing while continuing to, to create our own paths, but, you know, those are, those are fights and struggles that are much clearer, are much more coherent because of the labor that he did in his life. So, um, yeah, I, I don't know, I, I might just watch, like, 15 minutes of Nation of Islam Obama impressions, uh, just to, 
to feel a little less depressed about the whole thing. But, uh... Yeah. Isn't it terrible to hear about the storm right. and flood Liberty City? I mean, to think of all those old bicycles and doors just washing away. All right, cool. That's going to do it for me. Um, thank you for watching this re-recording of a previous discussion. Um, and, uh, yeah, if you're watching at the end of a YouTube video, uh, feel free to like and subscribe to let me know that you enjoyed it. Uh, otherwise, I stream on Twitch weekdays, 1 to 3 p.m. Eastern Time, and um, put out all sorts of content, including Hearthstone, GTA V, probably going to play some Sonic, um, but it looks like everything's going to kind of center around the political stuff. So um, feel free to subscribe for that to, for that kind of content. Um, otherwise, I will see you next time, probably Monday. Have a wonderful, wonderful evening and weekend.